It never ceases to amaze me the oftentimes that we're all thrown off course because of the advice of those who we have trusted to have our best interest at heart. Sometimes the wrong advice at the wrong season of our lives can do more harm than good. What I've learned is that over-reliance can be abusive. Trusting the same people over and over again for their opinion, for their recommendation, for their counsel, their guidance, their mentorship, all of that can be soothing in its place. But when the atmosphere becomes toxic, the impact can be to your disadvantage. I want to admonish you this morning to know them that labor among you. In fact, you need to know who's playing the harp in your life. Know what kind of atmosphere and song is operating in your life. And make sure the advice that you are receiving doesn't take away from the purpose of God for your life. Because every sound in your ear should encourage you and not cause resistance. Finally, if you're going to play the harp, make sure it's in the rhythm of deliverance. I pray this word blesses you and your family. In my quiet time, God left me with enough room to envision, to conceptualize, to assimilate. And the circumference of that moment reconciled my views, admitting the ecclesiastical writer as he arrogates the countenance of purpose, specifically the conspicuous nature of chapter three, when it determined that there was a purpose for everything under the heavens, upon which there are several characters, several morphemes that he appoints like dying and planning crying, laughing, plucking up, and being born. And he submissively held their responsibility in the arrangement of time. In keeping with the common practice of that narrative, the author writes as if he were some well-known person whose life would form a background for his own teaching. And after giving some thought, he takes as his starting point a saying that we're all familiar with, and that is vanity of vanities. All is vanity, and that includes wealth, pleasure, wisdom, and power. It is that thing that dominates the value system of life. And what makes the witness reliable is that these words do not suggest the temperament of a pessimist, but in reflection, Nothing can be compared to maturity and spiritual maturity. And this is the estate of our understanding. The ecclesiastical writer concludes that God never does anything without purpose. And the beneficiary of this premise is Romans chapter 8, and it reads on this wise. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose. And so when we incorporate that idea with our ministry, our apostolic callings, the instrumentality of our gifts, that opens up a portal for greater responsibility. That means that in our advancement, in our reach, in our approach, the sacred things of God deserves a deeper understanding and it deserves equity that will no longer give itself to overfamiliarity, passiveness, or resignation. Further scrutiny measures that the Bible as a whole is replete with the theme of purpose and God's intentionality. That means that the mind of God is the marquee for every deed for every task, for every pleasure, and for every job and tittle. I have found that there are certain affinities adjacent to the purpose of God, much like the Song of Solomon uses poetry to describe the context of marriage 
or the psalmist using allegories to prioritize worship. One of those affinities is the offering of praise, the offering of song. That's important because musical composition is annexed to the purpose of God. And so if the great pleasure of the ecclesiastical writer holds merit and the purpose of God is the complete expression of his intentionality, that is also true of musical notes, hymns, anthems, melody, and canticles. Because what we can't do is confine purpose to certain inclusions and then deprecate the width of God's eternal estate. Everything that God has created has been birthed according to purpose. Time, place, gifts, talents, anointings, and according to their purpose, their meaning is to influence glory. In other words, your calling is designed to task dimensions of elevation. If your intention, for an example, is to sing, that activity deserves the same promotion if I were to preach because the collaborative consummation between preaching and singing is that they both complement one another in the oneness of spirit. The stirring power of song in the universe of God's symphony is to release therapeutic provisions, overtones and colorings that applaud the readiness of the word of God. Every song has a place in its continuity and deference to God. And the goal of its presentation is to import authenticity. Many times what we do in song is to shape your readiness or prepare climatic readiness because the job of the psalmist or the hymnologist through a genre of music ministers to the advantage of both spiritual anticipation and spiritual ambience. As I think of what that looks like, what comes to mind is the triumphal entry of Christ because as he rides into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, part of that expectation captures groups of people spreading their cloaks or their palm branches alongside the road as a symbol of reverence or welcoming. And what that date recommends is the proper way of realizing that the Lord is with us. This is what the psalmist alluded to when he instructed for us to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And so while this occasion indicates victory and celebration, this is also another time in scripture that we get an opportunity to lay down what we are carrying, the cloak of unhappiness, the veneer of professionalism, the shawl of depression, the scarf of brokenness, the exterior of distress, the guise of show, because after all, Isaiah does remind us that he would give us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Laying down one's cloak in biblical times was an act of surrender. It meant to pledge your loyalty. It meant to amend your attitude. It meant to be compliant, unworthy, or submissive. The reason why this is important is because a collage of atmospheres and events tend to judge outcome. This is also true of moods because moods lead to idiosyncratic responses. In fact, moods are like fragrances because they give off certain smells and certain smells can embellish or they will bastardize important times. Whenever you come into an atmosphere that offers pleasantries and merriment, atmospheres that offer banter and gaiety and jocundity versus atmospheres that offers toxins, they will leave you with excitement. And these times are conducive for energy giving breakthroughs, lasting impacts, that anticipate some point in the future. 
No wonder song serves its purpose. It sets the tone. It characterizes intention. It leads the way for miracles. It sets a good example. It clears a path for rhythm, cadence, flow, tonality. If you read the pages of Judges chapter 1, the children of Israel needed guidance. And the first thing that they do is ask the Lord for rhythm. If you read the pages of 1 Samuel chapter 16, when an evil spirit came upon King Saul, what drove the evil spirit away was rhythm. If you read the pages of Genesis chapter 29, the Bible said Leah burst Reuben and then Simeon and then Levi and then rhythm comes out of her womb because Judah, her fourth child, means praise. If you read the pages of Ezekiel chapter 28, even Lucifer himself was familiar with music because the Bible said that tablets and pipes were prepared in him the day that he was created. Wherever there is glory, there is music. And because music and song is a ministry, every song has to be prepared for duty. And the preparation of that spiritual leadership has to do with the worshiper. The worshiper has the responsibility of facilitating the work of the Holy Spirit in the capacity of a minstrel. You have to understand that minstrels were professional flute players who were employed as mourners. Professional poets who was hired to make noise. Professional poets who were charged to change atmospheres. What you will notice is that there is a unique atmosphere in church culture that is encouraged for the prosperity of its parishioners. And the quality of that idea can be dismissed by the same opportunity that should encourage deliverance. The point that I'm trying to foster is that what can sometimes contaminate moods, disrupt flow, douse the anointing, muffle the effectiveness of fellowship, or even silence divine impartation are those who we depend on to lead our worship experience. Let me prove it. When Israel went up to Bethel, the reason why they sent Judah first was because Judah had a reputation of making noise instead of having to go into battle. Another example is 2 Kings chapter 7, which reads that the Lord caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. And they said to one another, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian king to attack us. My point of reference is that sound and music and atmospheres, minstrels, all of these positions reflect influence. And just as these examples give us deliverance, healing, and calm, they can also give us the opposite result. Because atmospheres can only respond to the elements released in them. This is why when Jesus goes to the house of Jairus, before he could heal his daughter, he puts everybody out, including the minstrels. And he put them out because the wrong atmosphere can be a distraction. The wrong atmosphere can encourage negativity in your life. The wrong attitude can put a bad taste in your mouth about church. Here are some examples I want to leave with you. And I want you to think about this. What are those things that you might need to get rid of yourself? What are those things that disrupt your peace? What are those items that's restricting the flow of the anointing in your life? Here's my point. Certain environments are toxic. Certain people having the wrong instrument in their hand can impact your life. Being in the wrong company can be a hindrance 
And sometimes you can't see the result you are looking for until the problem is exposed. This is not just a church problem. This is also a family problem, a job related problem. Can I prophesy to you? Your life deserves a better atmosphere, better conditions, and you have to decide your song of choice, and you also have to decide who you will allow to play the harp in your life. Because trust me, the wrong lyrics, the wrong tone, the wrong music, the wrong advice can disrupt the purpose of God for your life. I pray and I trust that today's word will be a blessing in your life. You be blessed until the next time.